that's cute, isn't it? But how cute do you think it would be if Aaron Judge from the New York Yankees did that? I think it's only cute because he's little and doesn't know better. But I wouldn't be surprised if there was a grandma in the crowd that said, that's cute, but if you do it again, I'll bring my paddle out, you know? <laughs> Here's the thing, though. Sometimes we stay in immaturity even as a mature adult. There's a spiritual immaturity that plagues a lot of believers that have professed Christ for years. And I guess I want to say it's not very cute to the Lord when we act with immature responses and a faith that is not matured and developed and sort of live our lives never really growing up spiritually. Last week we looked at the Apostle Paul uh, preaching so long that someone passed out and died in the service and encourage you not to do that today. Part of that is on me, as we saw from the scripture. And then at the very end of the story, in verse 17, it says that a group of elders, church leaders, left to go to an island called Miletus. In this week's message and text from Acts 20, 18 through 25, and next week's passage as well, finishing Acts 20, is Paul's only address in the book of Acts to believers. Normally, the messages that are recorded are to non-Christians, but this is a rare look. It almost sounds somewhat like Paul's letters that we read in the New Testament rather than the book of Acts. And while I know that not everyone present here is called to be a church leader, elder, pastor, overseer type person, all of us can be effectively charged with the spiritual maturity we see in Paul's address. And so we're going to look at 18 through 25 and talk about how to live a life of maturity. I'm first of all going to read verse 18 and 19. It says, And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. So this was a group that knew Paul well. And there is a sense where the wording of this falls in an unusual place upon us when we read it here. Because Paul is first of all saying, you all saw the way I lived among you. And in 1 Corinthians and in Philippians, he said, follow me as I follow Christ or look at my example. Most of us don't really want to say that to somebody. Hey, whatever you see me doing, you do the same thing. I think we'd be more comfortable with saying, do as I say, not as I do. That doesn't go over well with people, as it shouldn't. But Paul is trying to say, I'm not speaking to you as someone that you don't know. You've seen how the way I lived. And I want you to try to live a similar way in my absence. What he's saying is that I didn't live among you large. I wasn't a Christian celebrity. I was one of you just among you. And I think that's an important thing. The blank there, number one on your outline, is to serve God with lowliness. Go low in your <clears throat> spiritual journey. I remember one time going to West Africa with a mission team from our church, and I was asked to speak at a pastor's conference in Sierra Leone. And I didn't know the pastor, but the person from our church that helped arrange the trip knew him, and we were doing some mission work in the area. And so I spoke to the pastors about the character, characteristics of a Christian minister, that we should be humble, broken, generous, uh, th things like that. And I got to the, guy's ha the pastor's house at lunch, and it was a nice house amongst a lot of houses that weren't very nice, which didn't bother me. But I saw on his wall a picture of a Ferrari or some nice sports car, and it said something like, if you have faith, you can have one of these. <clears throat> and what I found out is that he was a prosperity preacher. 
And it's really a sad thing to see the health and wealth gospel take root among the poor in Africa. And it can get the, it can, anywhere, it can get people's eyes off of scriptural teaching and onto the things of the world. Some of you have, have turned on, in ch- surfing the channels, you've turned on a show that says if you have enough faith, you can always be healthy. And if you sow a seed of faith to this ministry, your wealth, your personal wealth in this life is guaranteed. And of course, those are, you can get a few statements like that from some really thin, out of context verses, but it's a lie that we should be about pursuing the stuff of this world. It's just simply not grounded in Scripture. And I think Paul is saying that we should, you, you've seen how I lived among you, and he said it wasn't big headed, it was big hearted. And that's the, that's the posture that we should all take spiritually. It says there in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility. Now humility is, the reason this sounds weird to us, because humility is not something you announce about yourself. You don't say, look how humble I am. Matter of fact, I, I learned a little bit of that recently because I was texting Pastor Stephen and his associate, Pastor Sean. Uh, we were talking about some very important spiritual stuff, the NBA Finals. And Sean is, uh, grew up in up north, and he's a Boston Celtics fan. I don't have to tell you. <laughs> we were trying to have church here. <laughs> I don't have to remind you where I'm from and who the Celtics are playing. They're playing the Dallas Mavericks. One of my great victories that I've had here is I've convinced Stephen Walgamont to root for the Dallas Mavericks. So he and I were bantering with Sean. And if you've seen the maps, they looked really good in the first three series. And we were picking who's going to win. I was quite confident the Mavericks would win. Um, and I said Mavs in six. Stephen said Mavs in five. And Sean just didn't say much. Well, at the end of the first quarter, the Mavericks were down by 17 points and remained in that zone the rest of the game, basically. And at the end of the first quarter, I wrote Sean and said, my phone is not receiving messages right now. <laughs> And then yesterday I said, you know what, I'm looking forward to game two tonight. And I said, I'm going into this game much more humble. And I said, nothing shows humility like announcing your own humility. (laughs) Right? Humility is not something to be announced. Humility is something that you live out. Now, humility is a hard word to define in some ways because it describes lowliness of spirit. It's the kind of lowliness that is hard to measure. And anytime we notice the growth of that grace in our life is when we take a step backwards from it. Now, humility was not a a virtue in the Greek society. Matter of fact, the opposite of humility, arrogance, was a value. If you were to display meekness, lowliness, it it was a vice instead of a virtue. And I think in some ways our, our culture now embraces that as well. We respect people that talk incessantly about their accomplishments and how amazing and great they are. And I think we need to learn to maybe appreciate certain things about folks that are arrogant without respecting that vice that the Scripture says is wrong. Do you know that the Bible says that God's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble? Let me see a show of hands out there. How many of you want to be opposed by God? I didn't think so. It'd be like wearing a, wearing a sign that says, God, take me down, please. Because he says, I'm opposed to you. Randy Alcorn says, here is how to be humble. Take a, a close look at God and a close look at yourself and notice the difference. <laughs> it was Puritan writer John Flavel that said, those who know God cannot be Those who know God must be humble. Those that know themselves cannot be proud. And so part of humility is a great self-awareness that we are recipients of God. You may have heard about the husband speaking to his wife and said, Sweetie, I know you always take a picture of me in your purse. She goes, yeah, it really helps me when I'm at the office. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, I look at it a lot. And he says, huh, I must have really worked out well for you. 
And she said, yes, in a sense, because whenever I go through a challenge, I, pick, I take out your picture and says, if I can face this challenge every day, I can face <laughs> anything. So sometimes our pride backfires on us. We are to be people that are aware that we're recipients. The scripture says, what do you have that you did not receive? Huh, I wonder what the answer to that is. I'd say, we're recipients of everything. Do you see a lot of people that are on the receiving end, fist pumping about their own greatness? No, we're recipients of God's favor, of his mercy spiritually. If you've been really successful, it wasn't because you were smarter than everybody else or even worked harder than everybody else on your own. If you worked hard and did well, it's because God gave you the strength to work hard and do well and gave you the very opportunity to do so. And so we're to serve with lowliness. <clears throat> and then it says, and with tears and with trials. Now, what, what he's saying here is that one, the lowly life of serving is hard. And then he says, but also learn to have, a, have your heart in the service. In other words, mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep. Don't be afraid to care so deeply that you will cry. It was said that one preacher said about D.L. Moody, the great preacher in our own country a century or more ago, was said that D.L. Moody is the only one qualified to preach on hell because he never does so without tears. Tears are a part of our calling. And it's part of a heart that cares enough about others to get in there and mourn with them. Now in verse 20 it says, But I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house. I think Paul's saying I had different pulpits. Publicly I taught you, and then in your homes I taught you. He's trying to say it didn't matter where I was, but what I was doing. Now what does he mean when he says, I didn't shrink back to declaring anything from you that is profitable. He says, I, I talked about everything that was for your own benefit spiritually. Next week, we're going to see in verse 26 what it meant when Paul says, I preached to you the whole counsel of God. But here he says something similar, is that I had a wide variety of things I said to you. Now, I had this memory of preaching class when I was in college. I was mentored by my professor. His name was Dr. James Shields. He went to be with the Lord a few years ago, and he was our, one of our professors in, in Abilene, Texas, where I went to college, and he was very, very West Texan and had this nice little drawl about him. And I, I sometimes remember questions I asked him in class, wishing I could have that question back now. But something I was curious about as a very young preacher was are, should we talk about things that we know more about and have better experience in? Or should we talk about things we don't know much about and aren't particularly good at? I was wondering that question. And the way I phrased it, and now this gentleman knew me well. And I said, Dr. Shields, should we preach on things that are our weaknesses or should we only preach about things that are our strengths? And he said, brotherly, if you don't preach on your weaknesses, you're going to have very little to preach about. <laughs> He's like, I know you, and you only got a handful of strengths, brother. <laughs> Unless you want to have four sugar stick sermons, yeah, you got to preach about stuff you're not good at, which has ha haunted me for years, right? But I think Paul's saying, I didn't have a few little sermonettes that I repeated over and over. I didn't hold back anything that you needed to hear for your own spiritual good. Now notice how he phrases the gospel. Verse 21 is a powerful phrasing of the gospel. It says this, testifying to both Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Repentance toward God and faith. Now he says to Jews and Greeks, meaning this, one message for all the groups of people. Isn't that true? That no matter who you are, Jew, Greek, or whomever, you need to hear the message of Christ. Now, Paul framed the delivery of it differently in Athens 
than he did in a Jewish town. But the core of the message was still intact as the very same thing. And it, there was no water added to it. It was a, what you might say on point number two. It says, share the undiluted gospel. I remember having all these sippy cups around the house when the boys were little. And I would often take them and get more juice in them. And I had a friend over one time. And I don't know if it was just because they were used to it or because I was a cheapskate and they got used to it. But I filled up the cup with about two-thirds of juice and about one-third of water. And one of my friends was over who served with me at a church several years ago. And his daughter ran out of juice. And so I took off the top and I put two-thirds juice in. I was about to put water. And he goes, uh, uh, uh. I'm like, what? He goes, Pastor, she drinks the hard stuff. (laughs) Even early in the day, you know. And I think sometimes we add water to the gospel. Maybe not because we're intentionally trying to be deceptive, but also quite possibly because we would like it to be a little more palatable to the world. And so we kind of sometimes, unbeknownst to us, soften it a little bit. And the way we soften it is through this first word by not emphasizing repentance. Repentance is having a heart broken for sin and from sin. It's an awareness that we're going the wrong path. And then we turn around, and it's one act. It's two sides of the same coin, repentance and faith. It's turning from, and it's turning to. Notice that faith has an object. Sometimes in the world you hear the phrase, hey, just have a little faith. And we as believers, it's not about the amount of faith that we have or don't have, it is where is our faith placed? And and Paul says, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Make sure, brothers and sisters, that you have dealt with sin as you're turning to Christ. Because we, we can't hold on our sin. We can't add Jesus to a life of unconfessed or unrepented sin. It doesn't mean we'll never struggle with sin again, but it means we acknowledge as we're turning to Christ that we are willing to turn from any lifestyle that doesn't honor God, any habit that doesn't please God. And our faith is not in anything else other than in Him, in our Lord Jesus Christ. Look, if you've ever placed your faith that this church will save you, I'm telling you this church can't save you. If you've ever placed your faith in your own morality, some people feel that they measure down the faith into a list of things that you do not do. And the repentance was good-natured, but our faith is not something that we melt down to a list of do's and don'ts, and thus I'm a Christian because I don't smoke or drink or chew or run with those that do, and I'm a good person, and I vote the right way, and I look the right way, and I talk the right way mostly. And so... That's not what faith is. No, faith is in someone. It's not in the waters of baptism. It's not in your own performance spiritually. It is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever, in an investment, put all your eggs in one basket? Sometimes those are the richest people in the world. And sometimes they're the most disappointed people in the world. But I want to tell you, this investment... You put all your eggs in the basket of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother, sister, that's a win. That's a win every time. Now in verse 22 and 23, man, I love our passage today. It is exquisite. It says, and now behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit and not knowing what will happen to me there. So we've noted for the last few chapters He's ready to go to Jerusalem, ready to deposit the offering. He says, constrained by the Spirit. In other words, he can sense deep inside that God wants him to go. And notice this. It says, not knowing what will happen to me there. Doesn't that give you a little bit of peace? Because do you ever feel uncertain about things in your life? Well, Paul did too. And there's a certain amount of uncertainty that goes with the territory of faith. Look, I read an article recently that since 2017, 
our country's interest in horoscopes has skyrocketed. There's sort of a national gloom about the economy, about politics, and people want to know what's going to happen to them. And so there's an arise in the occult. Look, I'm not saying that there can't be something you can learn from the dark side or the dark world here and there. Most of it is a scam. But if some of it's true, I want to tell you, that's not where you want to get your info from. We, there's a sense of uncertainty that is good for the soul. Are you one of those people that on a trip, you want to know everything you're about to do? You're so fun to vacation with, right? There's a certain amount of uncertainty that we just have to accept. Notice this in verse 23. Accept that the Holy Spirit testifies to me. Let's pause right there. This sounds like it's going to be a great verse, doesn't it? I don't know a lot, but I do know one thing. Now, by the way, why does it say the Holy Spirit testifies to me? Is that an expectation in our own Christian life, that the Spirit of God is going to tell us something about the future? Well... I don't like to say unequivocally what God doesn't do, unless the scripture is clear of what God doesn't do. But I would say Paul likely got a special word of prophecy from someone through the Spirit about his future. And I'm saying that that's not probably an expectation that we should generally have about tomorrow. Why? Possibly because the Spirit speaks to us from the scripture now. Paul had the Old Testament, but he's been used of God to write the New Testament. Now that we have a complete book of the Old and New Testament, I think God's Spirit primarily speaks to us from the Word. I won't rule out God impressing something on our heart from time to time. I just don't want you to read verse 23 and say, okay, cool. The Spirit told Paul something about his future, so I can expect the same thing in my life. I'm saying that's a definite maybe. But in verse 23... You're thinking it's going to end with something really uplifting. I don't know anything except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. Oh, that ended differently than we thought. He says, the only thing I know is that my future is going to be hard. (laughs) You're going, Pastor, if you're trying to encourage us today, you're kind of missing the boat. Is Paul a pessimist? You know what he is? He's a Christian realist. And I think we need more of him. I think sometimes optimism is only a thing when our circumstances are favorable. Of course we're optimistic when it's a bright, shiny day and our lives are bright and shiny and wonderful. But this is not where Paul's optimism lies. I mean, there's a lot about Paul that we know from other verses that's not said here, but Paul didn't mind a little suffering because he knew that God would use it for his good. He was able to say in Romans 5, 3 that we rejoice in our suffering because suffering brings perseverance. In other words, there's two ways to look at affliction and imprisonment. At the actual imprisonment itself or from the bigger screen as to what God is initiating. And so I think the takeaway from number three on your outline in these verses is this. Face the future with realism and confidence. Paul wasn't confident because he was on a nice little cruise ship having a great vacay. No, he knew that affliction was coming and imprisonment was coming, but he was confident that it was always going to be purposeful. I think sometimes things that are passed off as Christian cliches have a lot of meat in them that we should not ignore. Some of you followed the career of Tim Tebow in the mid-2000s. When I moved here, it was in the thick of Tebow mania, and everybody was talking about him, and everyone was hoping he would have a pristine NFL career. He certainly had a few good moments in the NFL. He had a bunch of interviews in the NFL, but a lot of disappointments as, as well, whether it was a bad game, or whether it was being traded to this team and not really being in the lineup anymore or finally getting cut after a few years. But I was, I kind of eagerly followed him. And 
every time someone would ask him about, well, what's next? You got cut from the Broncos. Are you going to get to play at, at New England? And he said the same thing every time I ever saw him. And he, was like, he said this, I don't know what my future holds, but I know who holds my future. That's an incredible thing to say, even if it's a little bit trite and greeting card rhymy. Because the truth is, none of us know what our future fully holds. But if you know who holds your future, and he happens to be sovereign, and he happens to be wise, and he happens to have all power in heaven and earth, and he happens to deeply care for you, then you know who holds your future. And it's going to be okay. It's said of William Carey, the father of the modern missions movement in the 18th century, when he moved from Britain to India, had a very difficult time in his surroundings. Took a long time before anyone embraced the gospel. And he was asked one day about his future, and he said, my future is as bright as the promises of God. One of our missionaries I was speaking with recently, who's having a hard time with his wife's health, support raising, etc., and he wrote a newsletter. At the very top of the newsletter, it said this, between a rock and a strong tower. You know that verse, the righteous, in the name of the Lord is a strong tower, the righteous run to it and are safe, Proverbs 18.10. You, you could have finished the sentence and say between a rock and a hard place. He goes, no, it's between a rock and a strong tower. What a great way to frame our challenges. In verse 24, it says, But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. So Paul had received a ministry, and it was to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And in verse 24, this is one of six times where Paul uses a race analogy. He was in, he had just come from Athens, where the original Olympics were still going on at that time. And so he took the idea of racing and applied it to his spiritual life. And he basically said to the Ephesian leaders, he said, run your race well. That's the blank on number four, run the race well. I'd say maybe 10 years ago now, our church or our Christian care center had a 5K. I'd never run a 5K before. And I retired after this 5K. And there were a group of walkers and a group of runners. And I was kind of a walking runner or something like that. Runners wouldn't have claimed me and walkers didn't care. So anyway, I was in the middle of the heat. But I, I didn't, I wanted to do, you know, decent-ish. And I was on the last K, so to speak. About 1K left. And I had passed the walkers and I couldn't see anyone in front of me. So I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to kick it up a notch. Right when I decided to do that, a young lady, about 20 years younger than me, zipped past me. Now, I have a burden for women's sports. I don't think men pretending to be women should be involved in women's sports. I also don't know that men and women should be in the same sports because men's ego can't handle it. <laughs> this girl passes me. So I decided to say, you know what, I don't want to get beat by a girl in front of my church, so I'm just going to kick it up a notch. Well, guess what she did? Kicked it up a couple more notches. And she had more notches than old Pastor Cliff, I'll tell you that. I finally finished and needed oxygen, basically. And I think some of us get involved in the Christian life in a sprint. And we have bursts of enthusiasm and then a lot of inertia and lack of energy. And Paul said, hey, this is a race, and I want to run my race well in the power of God. And he says, my life is not the issue. I don't count my life. He, has, he goes from an, account, from an accounting language to a runner's language. He has a calculator for a moment and says, as I've calculated, my life is not the important thing God's word is, God's will is. He, t he puts away his calculator, puts on his Nikes, and says, let's run well. I do have one other race that I remember, and it was back in fifth grade, back in grade school. I did a three-legged race on field day. Did you ever do that, where you tie your leg to someone else? Well, the, the, it, this is crazy. By the, the guy that I ran it with, we didn't go to the same middle school or high school. 
And when I'm 30 years old, around 30, I'd move back to my hometown of Fort Worth, and I took my kids to a Wendy's restaurant. And at Wendy's was Derek Williams, the guy that I ran the three-legged race with in fifth grade. He looked over at me and said, Cliff, and I said, Derek. And he goes, we won the three-legged race, remember? <clears throat> I don't think many good things had happened in his life since then because I'd forgotten all about him. But I will tell you this, we didn't win the three-legged race because Derek was connected to Cliff Lee. I won the three-legged race because I was connected to Derek, the fastest guy in our school. I don't know how he was stuck with me. And I want to encourage you in this marathon, tie your leg to Jesus, and you're going to make it. And you're actually going to do really well if you're tied to him. The last verse, 25, is this, And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I've gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. That's morbid, isn't it? This hit them in a really hard way we'll see next week. Why did he say this? Well, was he prophetic? Maybe. Is he trying to say, I'm going to die soon, or I'm just not coming back this way? We don't really know, but I think he's trying to say, this is a, this is a good bot. And brothers and sisters, sometimes our immaturity comes out when we have painful goodbyes and very hard losses. Sometimes those losses we have serve to move us forward with great vigor. But sometimes our immaturity is exposed by a painful loss and a tough goodbye. I'll never forget, my dad called a family meeting. He was battling cancer hard, and he was in his late 50s when he called this meeting. My sister and her husband had been in and out of a call to foreign missions, and they got a call to go to a very dangerous part of East Africa, and were basically accepting the call. But dad, he was very sick, and they weren't sure if they should go while dad was sick. And so dad called a family meeting. I had to come in from the Amarillo area back to Dallas. My sister lived in town, came over with her husband, and our, all our families gathered in our living room. And Dad said, I want everyone to know that I am 100% behind my daughter and my son-in-law going to the nations to take the gospel. And I may not be around when she comes back home. I, I do hate to tell you that when she came back for the first time, uh, as a, before a furlough, my, she came back to my father's funeral. And she did not get back in time to say goodbye. All of us remembered that moment where he said, I am for this. I won't see her face again, but I want her to take the gospel. And brothers and sisters, number five on her outline, how to live a life of maturity. We have to learn to accept painful losses. I'm talking to a group of people that know about painful losses, some of you. You've had deeply painful ones. And maybe they've exposed something that you were holding on so tight that it's hard to embrace today. But for some of you, I've seen with my own eyes how you've grown spiritually through trusting God amidst a painful loss. And we have to learn to do that if we're going to grow into the maturity that God has for us. I'd like us to take a moment and bow together and enter into a time of response this morning. And as we're bowed before the Lord, in a moment you're going to see on the screen a number that you can send a response to and say, I, I want to talk to someone about what it means to know Christ or I'm going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. But, but I'm going to say a word of prayer and as I say amen, I'd like you to stay with your head and heart bow before the Lord and Pastor Stephen will sing a verse of a song and you come this morning as the Lord leads. Heavenly Father, engineer circumstances to draw people to your truth even now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing?